Good afternoon. We will get started. I don't have any announcements aside from that this is the last lecture. We're going to pick, off, uh, pick up exactly where we left off uh, the last time with the goal of filling in the gaps between growth factor signaling, activation of growth factor receptors on the outside of the cell, leading to the G1 to S transition, and then ultimately today also to the progression through M phase. We'll start with the growth factors and their receptors. We're going to describe growth factor receptor signaling in broad terms. The reason why is that many of those uh, broad themes recur irrespective of the growth factor receptor. However, as with many things in biology, there are subtle differences between different growth factor receptor families to be aware of. However, many growth factors have uh, receptors and a special category of receptors called receptor tyrosine kinases. These are transmembrane receptors that recognize the growth factor as a ligand outside the cells. And they're called receptor tyrosine kinases because they have a tyrosine kinase domain and enzymatic activity on the cytoplasmic side of the RTK that is crucial for transmitting or transducing the signal from outside the cell to inside. I'll show this in cartoon form in a moment. After ligand binding to the RTK, there is transduction of the signal from the activated receptor tyrosine kinase uh, through a signaling pathway that involves that G protein RAS that I mentioned briefly a couple of lectures ago, and then a number of downstream effector pathways, of which one you'll hear about in greater detail today, that MAP kinase signaling pathway that I introduced briefly. How does this occur in, in general terms? What's shown on the cartoon on this slide is one prototypical receptor tyrosine kinase for a growth factor called epidermal growth factor. It was originally identified as a growth factor for the epidermis, but it's in fact a growth factor for a number of different epithelial tissues, and it's also a, a driving a proliferation signal that gets uh, aberrantly regulated during cancer, during tumorigenesis. The ligand for this receptor tyrosine kinase is called EGF. The receptor is called EGF receptor. It's a single pass transmembrane protein. You know now how those types of proteins are synthesized and trafficked to the plasma membrane to be expressed in this way. And on the cytosolic uh, side of this single pass transmembrane receptor, we have the tyrosine kinase domain, the enzymatic activity of the RTK. And then an extended cytoplasmic tail that within uh, this tail are contained multiple tyrosine residues that will ultimately get activated and, or excuse me, phosphorylated by the activated receptor, the active enzymatic activity. This occurs through dimerization when EGF binds to EGF receptor. There's a conformational change on the extracellular side of the EGF receptor, causing these two receptors to come together as a dimer. When the dimerized receptors come into proximity with one another, there are now two inactive tyrosine kinase domains in close proximity. And what occurs is that having those two inactive tyrosine kinase domains close to one another enables one of the inactive kinases to activate allosterically the other tyrosine kinase. There's more to say about that, but I'll spare you all of the details. I covered it in my other class. Um, but as a result of that allosteric activation of the tyrosine kinase, you now have an active kinase in close proximity to those tyrosine residues on this, the, the tail of the receptor, broad phosphorylation of those tyrosines, causing them to uh, become phosphotyrosines. And so an active receptor tyrosine kinase is, uh, is characterized by hyperphosphorylation on tyrosine residues, 
uh, on, this, on that tail. Once the RTK becomes activated, we now need to connect that hyperphosphorylated receptor to these downstream effector pathways, namely the monomeric G protein RAS. This is a slide I showed in a simpler form before. We had whole lectures dedicated to G protein coupled receptors, heterotrimeric G proteins. The monomeric G proteins are in the same category. They bind to GTP. They can hydrolyze that GTP into GDP, but their, regula their mechanisms of regulation are uh, different in subtle yet important ways. Here is the monomeric G protein cycle. The, the one recurring theme, if you will, for these monomeric G proteins is they're uh, somewhat wimpier in all respects uh, compared to the heterotrimeric G proteins. And what I mean by wimpier is that they need assistance of other interacting proteins to facilitate both the nucleotide exchange as well as the GTPase activity to hydrolyze GTP and turn it into GDP. <coughs> We'll start this slide over on the left-hand side of inactive RAS bound to GDP. What occurs for this, uh, what needs to take place for this exchange to occur is that inactive RAS must interact with another class of proteins called GEFs, guanine exchange factors, that facilitate the removal of GDP and the binding of GTP to convert RAS into its active state. And you'll see an example of a GIF in a moment. GTP-loaded RAS is the conformationally active signaling form of the monomeric G protein that can transmit that activity to downstream effector pathways. It gets shut off eventually under normal regulation through another category of proteins called GAPs, which stands for GTPase activating proteins. A RAS GAP binds to GTP-loaded RAS and potentiates its GTPase activity to enable that GTP to become deactivated, go to GDP, and then you're back at the other end of the cycle. So the transitions from RAS GDP to RAS GTP and back involve these GEFs and GAPs to facilitate the process. The last remaining point at the level of signal transduction is we have to connect active receptor tyrosine kinase signaling to the GTP loading of the RAS monomeric G protein. Here's how it occurs. And here's an example of how it occurs. There are other variations similar to this that will turn on the RAS map kinase pathway. If we start with growth factor on the outside of the cell, single pass transmembrane receptor, the receptor tyrosine kinase, ligand binding to the receptors, receptor dimerization, allosteric activation of the receptor tyrosine kinases on the cytoplasmic face, tyrosine phosphorylation of the tails of the receptors. Now what happened? What occurs is that there are specialized uh, domains in multiple proteins that uh, we all express that specifically recognize phosphotyrosine. And one of these uh, domains that recognizes phosphotyrosine specifically is called an SH2 domain. And what is, it, what is SH2 domain? SH2 domain stands for SARC homology 2. That just moves the questions of what the hell does SARC stand for? SARC is an oncogene. And at the name SARC comes from what it was originally uh, associated. It's a viral oncogene that caused sarcomas in birds. And so they cloned the gene out, and then they found that there was a cellular product, and they found that the cellular product had these certain domains associated with it. And those domains are broadly expressed in a variety of different proteins, normal proteins, uh, in our bodies. This specific SH2 domaining, uh, SH2 domain containing protein is an adapter protein. You'll see, we've talked about adapters before. You'll see why it's an adapter uh, in, a moment, in a moment. And it uh, binds two phosphotyrosines. It has two, two SH2 domains to be able to recognize the receptor. It's called GRAB2, 
for the reason it grabs two phosphatyrosines on the cytoplasmic phase. And GRAB2 acts as an adapter because it has a recognition domain for these phosphatyrosines, the SH2s. But in addition, another portion of this protein recruits a GEF to the active receptor, to the plasma membrane, where, recall, farnesylated RAF, uh, RAS is tethered to the plasma membrane. Once you have that guanine exchange factor recruited to the plasma membrane, in very short order, you'll have exchange of GDP for GTP on RAS, followed by activation of RAS to be able to turn on the downstream effector pathways. There are multiple signaling pathways that RAS can activate. We're going to emphasize one because it's the most direct path to the G1 to S transition. And that pathway is a kinase signaling cascade. We call it a cascade because there are kinases activating other kinases and activating other kinases via the process of phosphorylation. And this specific kinase signaling cascade is called the MAP kinase cascade which stands for mitogen-activated protein kinase. And mitogens, mitogens generate mitoses. All right, so a proliferation-inducing pathway and um, growth factors generally are often called mitogens for the same reasons. At the very bottom of this cascade are the MAP kinases themselves. I mentioned this briefly, they're uh, kinases that phosphorylate serines and threonines. I didn't give very many details on this, but how do you connect that to transcription factor regulation? Well, upon MAP kinase activation, there is a translocation of the MAP kinases from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. The translocation is, is in fact, a, a still a bit of a mystery. It does not conform to the conventional NLS type of regulatory mechanisms that I talked about a couple of lectures ago. However, once it translocates into the nucleus in its active form, it will go on and phosphorylate a variety of transcription factors that can modulate gene expression. In fact, we just had a, there was a seminar earlier today on MAP kinase signaling and the number of substrates for uh, MAP kinase, one, one representative MAP kinase of which there are three or four, by about 200 different substrates inside the cell. So a lot of things that happen. Several of them involve gene expression that we'll talk about today, but be aware that there are many other targets of the MAP kinase pathway. There were some questions the first time I showed this slide of why there appears to be this pyramid scheme of RAS to the MAP 3K to the MAP 2K. Um, and the motivation for it is to emphasize that as a result of the cascading of signals that occurs through this pathway, where a one GTP loaded RAS is able to activate allosterically multiple MAP kinase kinase kinases, MAP 3Ks, this one being RAF. And that active MAP kinase 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 can then phosphorylate multiple MAP kinase kinases, two kinases. And those then can go on and activate multiple MAP kinases. A very small change in signaling at the level of RAS can give rise to a very dramatic difference in activation down at the level of the MAP, MAP kinases. There are oncogenes that reside in this cascade. RAS, if it's mutated, if its GTPase activity is completely broken or its GEF binding ability is enhanced, it can become chronically GTP loaded. And these are the types of things that happen in pancreas cancer, colon cancer, uh, lung, lung cancer. Those are major places where you'll see RAS mutations. Going one step down, you can also get mutations in RAF. There's a point substitution that occurs in 15 to 20% of melanomas that renders RAF protein kinase activity always on, doesn't need RAS anymore 
uh, and it's a driver mutation causal for melanoma genesis. And in fact, there are drugs, specific, entire companies based on targeting the mutated form of RAF for melanoma therapy. Where the association of these signaling proteins occurs with regard to tumorigenesis is because they regulate things like cell cycle transition. That's what we're going to focus on today. And one of the key players in cell cycle regulation are a family of proteins that are called cyclins. They're called cyclins, more the association with the cell cycle, but it turns out that they vary cyclically in their abundance depending on the phase of the cell cycle. And that variation in abundance occurs as a rise for a period of time and then a fall. Some of them can rise very abruptly and fall very abruptly depending upon which cyclin we're talking about. The cyclins themselves don't have any enzymatic activity. They alone are unable to signal in any way, but their key partner uh, in cell cycle regulation is a family of protein kinases, also serine threonine kinases, called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. So cyclins pair with CDKs, and together those cyclin-CDK pairs give rise to an active kinase that can go on and phosphorylate a variety of substrates. You'll hear several today. This cartoon schematizes the rise and fall of several key cyclins in canonical cell cycle regulation. To orient you on this display, the crescents or boomerangs or things, whatever you want to call them around on the outside, those give rough indications of the abundance of the cyclin CDK complex that increases as a function of the phase of the cell cycle. The first point uh, that we're going to focus on is that G1 to S transition. And we're going to talk uh, at length at the complex of cyclin D and CDK4, 6. After that, we'll talk about the cyclin B, CDK1 complex and the variety of things that it does during uh, the, the G2 to M transition and execution of mitosis. To be able to talk about CDK4 or 6 and cyclin D, we need to introduce two other proteins that are in families of proteins that you've heard about before. You haven't heard about these specific ones. So uh, first, let's talk about a transcription factor. The transcription factor is called E2F. And E2F is um, a key regulator of the G1 to S transition. And the reason why is because the genes that are transcriptional targets of active E2F include things such as polymerase alpha, polymerase delta. Several of the CDK cyclin complexes that occur later during S phase. And that E2F is setting the stage for the next uh, phase of the cell cycle, which is S phase, be able to do DNA replication. In quiescent cells, though, E2F is, is around, but it's constitutively bound to a protein called RB. RB binds to and inhibits the transcriptional activity, the ability to recruit pre-initiation complex, all those things you've heard about before, um, that are mediated by E2F. RB. RB stands for retinoblastoma. And the reason why it's called retinoblastoma is because RB is a bona fide tumor suppressor. If RB is broken, and in fact, in just the wrong way, if RB is broken, it is sufficient to give rise to retinal tumors, eye tumors in, in, in children. And it relates to the cell cycle regulation that we're talking about now. In quiescent cells, RB is there. If it's normal, wild type, it's bound to E2F. And the RBE2F complex is inactive. It sits, it may be on the genes, but it's not recruiting any of the pre-initiation complex to drive transcription. But what occurs during growth factor signaling? Growth factor activates its cognate receptor tyrosine kinase. 
We have GTP loading of RAS, activation of the MAP kinase pathway, and then those nuclear localized MAP kinases turn on uh, genes, vectors of, of these the pathways, and one of the key transcriptional targets of active MAP, MAP kinase signaling is cyclin B. Cyclin B levels rise. As they rise, they form a complex with CDK4, CDK6, which then allosterically activates that CDK4-6 kinase activity. Interestingly, the mechanism by which uh, cyclin sticking to CDK4 or stick 6 and activating it is structurally similar slash identical to the activation of the two EGF receptor tyrosine kinase domains. The bottom portion of the kinase domain kind of looks like a cyclin, and they bind the same part of the kinase that they activate. Once you have active cyclin D, CDK4, 6 complexes inside the cell, you know, their major substrates is RB. They phosphorylate RB a lot, hyperphosphorylated. It's a dozen different residues. And that hyperphosphorylation of RB relieves the inhibition on E2F. RB no longer is able to, hyperphosphorylated RB is no longer able to bind to and inhibit E2F. And now E2F is disinhibited and can turn on things like polymerase alpha, delta, those other cyclin CDKs. One other note to ha have on this. Uh, in fact, this knowledge has also been applied for cancer therapy. There are now FDA-approved CDK4-6 inhibitors, inhibitors of that active kinase complex that are recommended for certain subtypes of uh, uh, aggressive breast cancer. So here's that same slide from before filled in with the details. We have growth factor up regulating the abundance of cyclin D, and that increased abundance of cyclin D activating CDKs, hyperphosphorylating RB, disinhibiting E2F, and transcribing genes, RNA, giving rise to protein that are necessary for S phase. That describes the upswing of cyclins. They can be transcriptionally upregulated, their abundance can increase. How do they, where, where does the other half of that crescent come from? And this occurs via a, a category of post-translational regulation in cells that we haven't touched on, we saved the best for last, uh, called ubiquitination or ubiquitilation, um, and also polyubiquitination. A lot of words there. What is ubiquitin? Ubiquitin called ubiquitin because it's everywhere. There's a lot of it. It's very abundant in cells. It's a protein, small protein. You see the molecular weight there. You see the ribbon diagram on the left-hand side. If you remember that quiz question way back in the beginning, like how many tertiary structures are in this? It was ubiquitin because I had it in my slide deck. This little protein that's here, there, and everywhere inside the cell is a crucial post-translational modification on proteins. This, the, the whole protein can be conjugated to other proteins by a family of enzymes called ubiquitin ligases. Ligase joined together, where they're joining together the protein and a ubiquitin group. Those proteins are linked by lysine residues. So ubiquitination occurs on lysines. Ubiquitin itself has multiple lysines. And the nature of the linkage can give rise to not just one ubiquitin, but there's other lysines on ubiquitin, put another ubiquitin on there, another ubiquitin, another ubiquitin, another ubiquitin. And now you give rise to a polyubiquitin, uh, ubiquitinated chain on the protein. And if that linkage is just right, I'm sparing you the details on which K48, K13, K27 linkages. The polyubiquitinin chain will be recognized by an organelle inside the cell called the proteasome and then rapidly degraded. I'm going to try to time this here. We have a little movie for a polyubiquitinated protein and its degradation by the proteasome. 
I timed this right. Yes. Okay. Proteasome is on the left hand side. It's a big garbage can with a lid. You'll see the lid open in a moment. And that is also sort of like a paper shredder, too, because everything that goes in, what comes out on the back end, is totally uh, shred to pieces. This And the yellow here, that's the protein that has been polyubiquitinated. And then this purple here is the polyubiquitin chain. When I play the movie, you're going to see the lid open up, and it will get shed in. It's recognizing the polyubiquitin. The polyubiquitin. The proteasome itself has deubiquitinating activity. And what it will do, it will take off the ubiquitin chains and not run them through the paper shredder because it takes a lot of energy to make the ubiquitin. So if you can double use them again, that would be energetically favorable. But the rest of the protein that's targeted for degradation will go in and then get proteolytically hydrolyzed into its basic amino acid uh, constituents. There's the recognition. There's the opening of the garbage can and then f feeding in the peptide. On the back side. And you see the purple tails on the end there still persist. Those will be reused and they can be used for other ubiquitin processes. This can occur very rapidly. Within minutes, you can have a turnover, rapid turnover of, of proteins. And in fact, we'll hear multiple ubiquitin regulated pathways uh, today. Ubiquitins bear critically on cyclin CDK regulation. There are many families of ubiquitin ligases that themselves are post translationally regulated by cyclin CDK complexes. And so how might this work in general terms? Cyclin is upregulated. It activates a CDK. That active cyclin CDK phosphorylates a ubiquitin ligase that is ordinarily inactive, but by virtue of it being post-translationally modified, activates its ubiquitin ligase activity. And it then conjugates polyubiquinates the cyclin, causing it to get degraded by the proteasome. There are many examples of this in cyclin CDK regulation. They're layered on top of one another, feedbacks, positive and negative. And so it's a very um, important and complex regulatory circuit within the cell cycle m machinery um, that is crucial for the characteristics of cell cycle progression, the cycling, the notion of checkpoints, the decisiveness of several of these uh, transitions. And in fact, for those that are interested in systems biology or things that respect a number of models, quite nice models on different facets of cell cycle regulation. We've just finished describing the G1 to S transition. Let's pivot now to the steps involved in mitosis, and specifically this complex of CDK1 and cyclin B. Passage through mitosis involves a number of steps. You saw this in the pre-lecture I think you had last time. During prophase, that euchromatic nucleus needs to be condensed into the, cr the chromosomes for them to ultimately be segregate segregated. So chromosome condensation needs to occur. During prometaphase, the nuclear envelope needs to break down because you're getting ready for the later steps in uh, mitosis. That involves modification of nuclear lamins, intermediate filament proteins that provide the structural integrity of, uh, for the nuclear envelope to form. That needs to break down. During metaphase, you need to find form the mitotic spindle. Microtubules need to be polymerized and finding the centromeres of each uh, chromosome and sister chromatid to be able to segregate them 
those sister chromatids need to separate. They need to be stuck together for as long as they get the right attachments with the microtubules, but once everything is right, they need to fall apart synchronously for chromosome segregation to occur. And then finally, myosin, the actinomyosin machinery needs to be activated in the, the cleavage furrow to be able to complete cytokinesis during the telophase. All of that is regulated either di directly or one or two steps removed by CDK1 cyclin B, CDK1 cyclin dependent kinase 1, and this family of cyclin, uh, cyclin B. CDK1, the kinase, is uh, its abundance is not regulated in a cell cycle dependent manner. It's always there. Where the regulation occurs is at the abundance of cyclin B that allosterically activates CDK1. It varies, and it varies very acutely during mitosis. And here's all the cool stuff that CDK1 cyclin B can do. It will phosphorylate families of proteins called condensins that help to drive um, positive supercoiling of the DNA to drive that condensed state that you see when you like the X-shaped chromosomes. Right? That involves a lot of coiling of the DNA to be able to have that condensation to occur. The activity of those is regulated by CDK1 cyclin B. The intermediate filament proteins that comprise the nuclear lamina are phosphorylated by cyclin B, uh, CDK1 cyclin B. And that phosphor, those phosphorylated lamins no longer can form the intermediate filament structures, that head-to-tail assembly that uh, you learned about during the cytoskeletal uh, lecture. And that gives rise to nuclear envelope breakdown. The ability for the mitotic spindle to form is dependent upon the nuclear envelope breakdown. So when the nuclear envelope breaks down, recall that RAN GTP gradient, the importance and exportance, there's no more a barrier. The NPC is gone, the things. And it's that uh, disruption of any gradient between the nucleus and the cytoplasm that creates the driving force for the mitotic spindle to occur. And in fact, several of those regulators play a role in nucleating the uh, mitotic spindle. And in addition, when we're talking about the cohesion of the sister chromatids during, during metaphase, those uh, sister chromatids are kept in check of, of one another, kept stuck with one another, via a phosphorylation catalyzed by CDK1 cyclin B. There's a protein called uh, securin that is modified and helps maintain those sister chromatids together um, at the centromere. And yet when it's time for chromosome segregation to occur, CDK1 cyclin B will activate a ubiquitin ligase called the anaphase promoting complex, or APC, that will drive the turnover of proteins, including several of the ones that are involved in the chromosome, uh, chromosome segregation, to drive anaphase, that's the name APC, and complete the uh, turnover of proteins such as cyclin B to complete mitosis. And then finally, the phosphorylation of myosin itself, the cleavage furrow, furrow during telophase, that activity is regulated by cyclin B, CDK1. That's a lot. Let's try to put this together in a, in a cartoon here. As cyclin B levels rise, during mitosis, you're going to get activation of CDK1, phosphorylation of the, the lamins, giving rise to nuclear envelope breakdown. Here, the sister chromatids are held together by a complex that involves this protein called securin. It's not shown on this cartoon, but it's kept secure by CDK1 cyclin B activity until it's no longer phosphorylated, and then it gets ubiquitinated and degraded. Degradation, then, is the driving force for a sister chromatid separation during anaphase. And then very rapidly, you have the maintained activity 
of cyclin B, C, D, K1 to activate myosins, the actin cables, and cytokinesis. But then as the last step to close out mitosis and cytokinesis, cyclin B is rapidly degraded to ubiquitination, catalyzed by APC. Not all the arrows went away, but now you're back to homeostasis, all right? You've gone through, com completed the cycle. Now the arrows went away, exit from mitosis. We've gone through two of these key transitions when there are, when everything is right in the cell, when there are growth factors, when there's enough cyclin B, when the chromosomes are properly aligned and, and mitosis can proceed. And there's an important role for cyclins to be played in those. Overlaid on top of the cyclic activity of the cell cycle, there are multiple what are called checkpoints that allow the cell to pause at several key transitions if the conditions are not right for the cell to move into the next phase of the cell cycle. And I mentioned these uh, briefly. I'll talk about one in greater detail because it relates to something that you've heard about before, DNA damage. And then it also relates to a number of proteins almost all of which uh, are implicated in tumorigenesis. If the cell has experienced DNA damage, either from the environment or as a result of errors during replication, it probably should not proceed to the next phase in the cell cycle if there's an opportunity to repair that DNA damage before going forward and heritably incorporating it into the genome. And the there's a key pathway uh, in the cells that involves a transcription factor called P53, famously called the guardian of the genome, P53. The, where the P comes from is it stands for protein. And so 53 means it is a molecular weight of 53 kilodaltons. And so when no one knows what to call it, they just call it P and then whatever the molecular weight is. on an, uh, polycrylamide gel, amino block, things you'd heard from before. And so the name stuck and it's called P53 because of its molecular weight. Where does P53 reside? Ordinarily, in normal cells, we have active transcription for the P53 gene all the time, but in normal cells, you'll see hardly any detectable P53 protein. And the reason why is that P53 is chronically ubiquitinated and degraded by virtue of the activity of a ubiquitin ligase called MDM2. And so MDM2 is ordinarily active, ordinarily turning over P53 and keeping the levels low. Unless there's DNA damage, double strand breaks, chemotherapy, ionizing radiation, a lot of these pathways will turn on a kinase called ATM. If I, it stands for a hereditary cancer predisposing disorder that I won't even try to uh, pronounce because I'll mangle it even though I try to say it. ATM. And ATM becomes activated in the presence of DNA damage and other DNA damaging stresses. Once this kinase becomes activated, it can phosphorylate P53 it can also activate another tumor suppressor called CHECK2, checkpoint kinase 2, that also can help with the phosphorylation of P53. And when P53 gets phosphorylated, it's no longer recognized and ubiquitinated and turned over as efficiently by MDM2 as when it's not phosphorylated. This gives rise to stabilization of P53 in cells. The levels go up. When the abundance of P53 goes up, now it can serve its biological function, I already said those things, which is to act as a transcription factor. And the genes that it transcribes, there are many. There's a lot of context and tissue specificity in P53 transcription, but multiple bona fide targets of P53 fall into these two main categories. The first one 
will be as if there's a short-ish stabilization of P53. A little bit of environmental stress, a little bit of DNA damage, a short stabilization of P53. One of the first genes that will get turned on is a protein called P21. You can imagine what molecular weight P21 is. And what PD, uh, P21 is, is a CDK inhibitor. It inhibits CDK activity by forming a ternary complex with the cyclin and the CDK. So I said before, CDKs are inactive unless they have their cyclins. You put a cyclin in there, and now that CDK will become active. If you put a CDK inhibitor onto the active cyclin CDK complex, now the CDK is inhibited again. And P21 is a potent inhibitor of CDK4-6 activity, causing the cells to arrest in G1. No phosphorylation of RB, no cell cycle progression. The cells chill out for a while and wait for the damage to be repaired. If the damage gets repaired, there's no longer ATM signaling. There's no longer active check 2. There's no longer phosphorylation of P53. P53 gets turned over, ubiquitinated and degraded, and then the transcription factor activity goes away. P21 will eventually turn over, and then the cell can progress through the cell cycle unless the damage is really bad. If the damage is really bad and so extensive, then the ATM check 2 activity is sustained. P53 transcriptional activity is sustained as it's in the nucleus longer. It has opportunity to find other loci in the genome and turn on, let's just call them less potent transcriptional targets of P53. And many of those targets drive programmed cell death, apoptosis. Decision being here, well, better to sacrifice this cell because it's broken goods now at this point. The damage is so bad. If you mutate here, if you mutate here, if you mutate here, and if you mutate here, all of these are tumor suppressors or oncogenes and are associated with different forms of the disease. So really important for cancer. Why? We're talking about lots of pathways that could be important. The statistics on this change, but it, uh, about 50% of all cancers have mutated P53, or some mutation in the pathway that has inactivated the P53 uh, guardian of the genome function that I talked about before. It's really potent and really recurrent because it's the breaks on all other forms of DNA damage that could give rise to more mutations. So once P53 becomes inactivated, the guardian of the genome function has been relieved, and now it's that much easier for these premalignant cells to pick up additional mutations and go forward in tumorigenesis. And then the Additional reason why you see this pathway disrupted so frequently in cancers is because it's really easy to break P53. It's a tetrameric transcription factor. So you have four P53s are required to form the transcription factor activity of, uh, the, of the protein. And you can break the, the tetramization domain. You can break the DNA binding domain. If you just break one of the four subunits, the whole complex is poisoned. And so one mutation will give rise to a so-called dominant negative activity that will disrupt all of the P53 function in cells. Thus, it's the combination of very breakable and very potent when it's broken that the thinking is why it recurs so frequently in um, tumorigenesis. We now have all of the elements that we need to return to human papillomavirus and gain an understanding of how it's associated uh, with cervical cancer. A few more details on the virology of HPV. It is a so-called non-enveloped protein, which means there's no lipid envelope around on the outside. What's around on the outside is a protein 
uh, what's called a capsin. This is a self-assembled protein. The protein itself is called L1, that when it's translated, it forms a monomeric unit that can self-assemble, forms a ball, a shell around on the outside, and in, encloses or encapsidates the double-stranded circular genome of HPV. If you were to crack it open, what's inside here is the double-stranded circular genome. The strains that are associated with cervical cancer only encode 10 genes uh, in that piece of circular uh, DNA. And the association of HPV infection with the promotion of cervical cancer is not simply the infection itself, but the integration, the insertion of the HPV genome into the genome of the cervical epithelial cells or the cervical cancer cell. In other words, what's occurring is that circular piece of DNA is cut open and then pasted somewhere into the cervical epithelium genome, and that's what's the driving force for um, cervical cancer. Okay, this is the class participation time. So, yes, good, heads up. If you're snoozing, wake up. All the rest of the class is interesting. These are the 10 genes of HPV, and I think you're in the position, if you've recalled things beyond like what I told you in the last five minutes, to be able to attribute a function for each one of these uh, gene products to either the process of infection or to the promotion of uh, cervical cancer. And so we can go from top to bottom. E1, E1 is a viral helicase. What do you think it might do? This can be a very boring half an hour. Okay, so you know, I, I heard genome interactions, um, and then the, the, then there was the last thing you said, which I, I heard it and I'd forgotten it already. God, that's good. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Yeah, so DNA replication, and in fact, the interaction with the human genome is not required for this, is not absolutely cr crucial for the helicase function. Where the helicase function comes in, it is crucial for DNA replication, its own DNA replication. So this is a double-stranded DNA genome. It needs to replicate. It has its own supercoiling issues that need to get uh, resolved when it replicates. The other thing that I forgot to say is that the order of these genes are in the order in which they're transcribed and translated. So why not also have the helicase get the whole process started to be able to start being able to replicate the DNA? So you're absolutely right. Okay. E2. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. E1, E2, hand in hand, partners in crime. You need the helicase. You need the origin binding proteins, the equivalent of origin binding proteins for that circular genome to be able to uh, start the replication fork that will go and replicate the genome. Nobody knows what E3 does. Everybody gets a free pass for that. How about E4? This one's harder. I think you're right, and as much as we understand what this gene does, you break down intermediate filaments. When we talk about intermediate filaments, they're an important structural component of the cells. Recall that when we talk about epithelia, you need to have, uh, there are different types of epithelia, but they have a polarity associated with them, they have a barrier function associated with them. This is on a mucosal surface where the infection is occurring. 
the activity of this uh, gene will help sort of loosen up the tissue to promote infection going, going forward. That's what the, the, the current thinking is of this. E5. Okay, so proper transport inside the cell. Might there be one thing in particular that you think would be especially critical in endosome? Well, the, what needs to get out of endosomes is trying to avoid getting into the lysosome. Ideas? This is for, I'm not picking just on you. Yeah? Correct. Recall botulinum toxin, recall ricin. Viruses come, I didn't tell you this, that's why this is a trickier one. You have virus outside the cell, virus has to go inside the cell. The way that the outside the in happens is that it binds to viral receptors on the uh, cervical epithelial surface. It gets endocytosed. It's in an endosome. If it doesn't escape the endosome, it will get degraded by the lysosome and then no effect infection. So it needs to escape from the endosome to be able to get into the cytoplasm to be able to replicate. And so the inhibi inhibition of the acidification prevents the maturation of the endosome and favors escape from that, um, from that organelle. E6. It's E6 and E7, which are the tumor-promoting genes of the HPV genome. You have RB bound to E6 and chronically inhibited. Who cares about the CDK activation, abundances of cyclin D? You've just taken the brakes off of all of G1S transition. Why might, this, why might the virus want the cell to proliferate? Especially if it's integrated in the genome, right? Okay. Um, and so more proliferation of infected cells, things can favor the selfish gene and the selfish genome to get passed on to the progeny. Oh, we skipped, oh, okay, so we did E7 first. That's fair. We, we do need to do E6. E6. Okay, so there's an element of continued proliferation. And the follow-on question is, is, but where is the stress coming from? If, it, if I said in normal cells, you don't have P53 levels are low, why should you have favor the degradation? Why would the degradation be necessary, you think? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that integration to occur, circular genome, linear chromosome, to get this in there, it involves at least two DNA breaks, double-strand DNA breaks, that'll activate ATM, check two, P53, and then stop until the damage gets repaired, right? So that's not good for the viral integration and progression. Inhibiting P53 allows bypass of that pathway to have a continued infection and insertion events. E8. Mm -hmm. 
this harkens back to transcriptional regulation. We saw some themes then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have the broad themes of that. If the genome is actively replicating, it can't be inserting, and it certainly can't be encapsidating, and it can, this can also release additional infectious virions as well. All of those processes are not possible when you have polymerase and helicase unwinding the genome. Those eventually need to get shut off. End product repression and these types of things, so there's enough of that, and then it goes, shuts it down so that the next phase of viral pathogenesis can occur. E stands for early, L stands for late, and these are the final steps in viral pathogenesis. You need, one needs to um, get that replicated viral genome into the capsid, aided possibly by uh, L2, and you also make, need to make the capsid itself, and that's what the L1 protein is. So translated, transcribed, translated, self-assembled, out goes the virus. Outstanding, very good. We have a number of cancer researchers in BME. We have a number of cancer researchers at the university at large. We have a NCI-sponsored cancer research center. Kristen Nagley is our latest hire, entirely dedicated on tyrosine phosphorylation. Once you get her started, she's really excited about tyrosine phosphorylation. Kim is our uh, cancer therapeutics uh, faculty member, largely focused on pancreatic cancer, and my lab works on breast cancer. and we're keeping right on time. I got 15 minutes for closing remarks. Um, first, and I need to do this in order because if I mess it up, it doesn't land as well. Acknowledge TAs first. All right, so Paige is here today. Josh on here on the off days. You know the way that they helped. Extra office hours, they're gonna help while I'm uh, traveling uh, right before the exam. You get your quiz scores posted in grade book fast. We try to turn around the peer reviews and things promptly. Uh, that's, that's me maybe cracking the whip, but me not, definitely not me doing it. That's these guys getting the things finished. And so for that, I'm very uh, appreciative. Can we give Paige and then Josh on his absence? <laughs> Round of applause. You can tell who went to a bookstore today. I was like, Thank you. Right. It's been a little busy. And I have one for Josh on too, I guess. Next time I see him. And then I want to give a, a reference to the pre-reading. That was a fun read. I'm not going to quiz you on this. But I give it to you uh, as a commentary, food for thought, something to uh, chew on and reflect on why we ran this class the way that we did. There are so many things that are searchable on your computer. But if you're relying entirely on that access to have to punch in and be able to uh, get the information that you need, you can't have a meaningful conversation with anyone. And what we try to do in this class is provide you with the, at least the fundamentals, at least the groundwork, such that you can have a competent conversation with a molecular and cellular biologist. And the only way that that can occur is if you have this muscle memory for these terms, for the vocabulary, for the precision in the language to know what activate, inhibit, disinhibit, I can keep going on, right? All those blue terms, it wasn't to torture you, it was to emphasize that words have meaning, and the only way that you can have those words have the meaning that they, that they convey is to make sure that you have mastery over them up here, not over here. And so to drive that home, let's see how I do this here. I'm gonna bring up the little video that was in the introductory lecture, pre-lecture at the beginning of the class. All those blobs and things moving around, maybe there was Music, maybe there wasn't, I don't remember. You should know 90% of this. It's better with the sound, so I'm turning up a little bit. Okay. This is a leukocyte rolling, monocytes in the circulation, interacting with 
catch bonds, selectins, things like that. I think he did that in quarter two. Lipid rafts. This is a spectrum. I didn't get a chance to cover that. It gives membrane some structural integrity. Did a lot of this with Professor Barker. Actin cytoskeleton, cross-linked. Nucleating actin filaments, microfilaments. These are actin severing proteins. Microtubule, nucleation and elongation. Dynamic instability. Motors, right? Walking on a microtubule. Let's see if I can pause this right at the point here. Um, oh, let me go back. You guys, you should, from here, you should be able to tell what motor it is. How much do you really remember quarter two? What motor is this, and why? Okay, I hear, I hear one on the right track. It's either uh, dynein or kinesin, because I know it walks on microtubules. Can you glean the orientation of the microtubule from here? I might not have paused it, but the. The MTOC is back into the page, so they're radiating outward. The plus end is outward, the plus directed motor, kinesin. I bet about 50-50 on that, depending on the size of the class. Oh, maybe that was the better view. There's the microtubule organizing center. Nuclear pore complexes, exporting, cap, capped in polyadenylated RNA, forward search of the ribosome, translational assembly, circular mRNA, circularized mRNA, some mitochondrion over here. Co-translational import into the rough ER. Pinocytosis. More kinesin. Is the, the Golgi stacks, Golgi apparatus? Exocytosis. Trafficking of transmembrane proteins to the plasma membrane. Integrins, binding to the extracellular matrix. RGD, all that stuff. The leukocyte stops rolling, turns on ECM, proteolytic activity, sneaks into a couple, between a couple of endothelial cells. Go find an infection somewhere. Molecular and cellular biology that you learned in this class happens in the videos, it happens in if Armani, you write all the time, on your every day. You oh no. I write. We saw how those processes, turn that down, how they operate normally. We saw how they can go wrong during disease. We saw how they can be corrected during certain therapies. Um, and the details, the extent to which you remember them is fine. But what I hope that you'll take away from this is just the thought process and the care that needs to go into those details when you talk about them, if you study them, if you work on them in the lab. And so I hope you take forward that as you go on to your careers in medicine or engineering or in science. All right, thank you. If there are no further questions, I'll see you in 10 days.